Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk. But to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy. And I'm here with featured guest, Dana Anspa. Dana, are you ready to join the mission? I am ready. I love the mission and uh, I've had my share of mistakes. Well, yes, and I'm looking forward to learning from you about them. And I have some other reason why I'm looking forward to talking with you today, which I, I talked to you briefly about earlier, but we'll have some fun conversation. But let me introduce you to the audience. Dana is the founder and CEO of Sensible Money, a firm specializing in retirement income planning. In 2022, Sensible Money ranked on the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing privately owned companies in the US. She is the author of How to Plan for the Perfect Retirement, a lecture series on the great courses and control your retirement destiny available on Amazon. She has hundreds of articles online and numerous educational webinars on YouTube. Because of her continuing contributions to financial literacy, Investopedia named her three times the top, the country's top 100 financial advisors. Dana, take a minute and tell us about the unique value that you are bringing to this wonderful world. Well, thank you for that amazing introduction. You know, my passion is working with people who are in what we call the decumulation phase, that point in time where they need to live off their acorns. And uh, it came about... I tell this story sometimes. It was about 2003. I worked for a CPA firm. This couple came in that reminded me of my grandparents, and uh, they brought in 10 years worth of brokerage statements. They were 65, and their money hadn't grown at all in 10 years, and we traced back what had happened over that 10 years, and every time they had expressed a concern, the broker had just moved them into a new commission product. And I just, like, that sparked something in me. I thought, you know, they're 65. It's They can't go back to work. They can't start over. They, their money in just a, a broadly diversified portfolio should have almost doubled over that same time frame. And, and we have to do better as an industry. So it really kicked off my spark and passion to work with people who, you know, are at a different stage of life where the stakes are higher. Mm. I mean, I was just, uh, I heard you talk on another podcast, tell that story. And I just like, it's heartbreaking, really. And when I think about uh, just yesterday, I was talking to someone, a person I recently met, and they told me somewhat of a similar story. You know, they're, they got, they're working with, you know, in, in Asia here, it's all about private bankers and all of that stuff. So it's like the prestige angle hooks them in. And then they don't realize that they really didn't make any money over five or 10 years because all that money went to the fees of these, you know, guys. And I have a story of some people that uh, friends of mine that sold a business, made a lot of money from it. And then they listened to the banker that gave them advice and they lost half of half of that money. You know, I was talking with a colleague in preparation for this podcast about some of investing mistakes and and also how our clients that made the money because we're working with them, you know, at the point where they're like, well, how am I going to live off of this? And, you know, many saved diligently their whole life. Some had concentrated stock. And we all hear these stories, though, of people who made money taking big risks, but to keep it. You don't, you can't keep taking those big risks. Like if you're by nature a big risk taker, which most entrepreneurs are, and my nature is a risk taker, at a certain point you realize, wait a second, like if I've been lucky enough to have one risk pay off big, like let's let's call it quits now and invest in a you know a boring, stable way that's gonna help me preserve what what I've been lucky enough to create. And that's a great reminder for all the you know, entrepreneurial minded people listening and viewing that are basically like, yeah, I'm going to make tons of money in my business. Oh yeah. And you may just lose a lot of it after you're successful in your business, because you're going to take the confidence that you have that you've built rightly. So for the work that you've done to create the value in your business, and you're going to take it into this 
crazy thing called the market. <laughs> and the market and the people yep. involved in it are all so random and so difficult that it's very, very difficult to, you know, master that. And so therefore you go in with that confidence and the market takes your money away. Yeah, it, it can. It certainly can. Yeah. You have to be very prudent and, and smart about how you're going to invest. You know, I, I thought about your target market about, you know, 55 and, you know, people that are going into that phase. And I thought, you know, why, why would you target that? You know, like I thought, oh, target, there's so many advisors, like I target young people, people who are making good salaries and stuff. And then, um, then I was like, duh, my parents, uh, my dad worked for DuPont and he works all of his life for DuPont from 1965 until he retired. And uh, my mom was a housewife, so they raised us on, you know, a, a, a corporate salary. My dad wasn't like a senior executive. He was a salesman and he did a good job, but it's not like he was making a ton of money, but they made the right decisions. And somehow they ended up retiring in North Carolina in Charlotte at, you know, a little bit early. I think it was 58, maybe, maybe it was 60. And <clears throat> So they moved to Charlotte and my dad worked for DuPont at, in Charlotte for a while, but then eventually they retired and they found an advisor there and they worked with that advisor. And the first thing the advisor did was say, uh, you know, you've got like 60% of your portfolio is DuPont stock. And what would happen if DuPont went down by, let's say 70% and it went down to, you know, X. And my dad looked at the guy and my mom tells the story. My dad looked at the guy and said, it'll never go down to X. And he, she said, sure enough, Many years later, it went down to X. Luckily, the advisor had gotten them out and had, had di diversified them. And my parents lived 22 years on their retirement yeah. savings and investment and pension and all of that. And that's a yeah. single family, you know, that, that's a single earner with three kids. And they were able to do the things they wanted to do in their retirement. And when my father passed away, my mother was in a rehab for her stroke and I brought her to Thailand seven years ago. And we had the choice of leaving, you know, staying in the U S and using the insurance and stuff or coming to Thailand. And it's a little bit more cash. You know, it's not getting the insurance benefit so much, but when we looked at the money that they still had after we sold the house, it was enough to say, mom, you don't have to worry about money for the rest of your life between the money that that my mom and dad had saved and accumulated. And of course, being with me, you know, I'm going to make sure that that's safe. Yeah. And that is the dream. Yeah. And so when I heard that you're focusing on people who are entering that retirement phase, I just thought, God bless you. Well, thank you. I mean, that's a wonderful story about your parents and, you know, it's, it, it illustrates exactly what I said. The stakes are higher. And, you know, as to why you, you have can part so much value on someone at that stage, like literally we can be the difference between them running out of money or having a comfortable retirement. And so that is, is just, it means a lot. And, and it, it imparts a lot of, you know, gratefulness to our work like every day we feel like it's such an honor that people trust us with these decisions and we know the difference that our work is making so it's it's um saving you know, lives it comes from the heart <laughs> saving lives i mean i'm telling you it's my yeah. mom's and I've, I've talked to her what would it be like if we if you were basically had run out and we were sitting in this yeah. situation it's a whole different ball game so that's why I really was yeah. excited to get you on to to hear more from you what you're doing and and to get to know you. And I think for the audience, you know, yeah. I'll have links in the show notes to all of your, you know, stuff so they can follow you and get your books and do all the other stuff and see the videos. So I appreciate that. But now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Oh my goodness. So as you and I spoke, it was hard for me to pick because I am by nature a risk taker. And um, But the best story and the worst in, in terms of time and money started um, my best friend, one of my best friends, her name is Lisa, and she got married and moved to North Carolina. And her husband and, and her um, were, well, her husband mostly was a founder in a fitness franchise called Rockbox Fitness, which I love. 
<laughs> so let me get this straight. I love, it's the best workout I've ever been to. Now, I'm a financial planner and have been doing this since 1995, but I also taught aerobics for about 12 to 15 years of my life, was in gyms my whole life, grew up in a gym. So fitness has, has been part of my life. Well, I flew out to North Carolina. I was, you know, with my fiance and we were checking out this, you know, going to rock box. And I was like, this is amazing. This is the best workout I've ever been to. Like, how much does it cost to open a franchise? Well, we started looking at it and it, it seemed reasonable. I think, you know, a franchise fee for one at the time was maybe 30 or 40,000. And um, there were none in the Phoenix area yet. And so next thing you know, we're off. We're like, that's it. We're going to open a franchise. And so, you know, what do we do? We sign up to open four because I understand economies of scale and I'm not going to make money on one. Like if I'm going to have one in order to make this viable, like let's let's do four. So we, you know, find our location, this beautiful location, a mile from the house, because, you know, I'm running a full-time business here at Sensible Money. And so, you know, how am I going to help with that too? And and so, you know, everything goes great. We do the pre-sales. We follow the program exactly. We open our wonderful franchise um, October of 2019. And uh, actually had at the time the most successful franchise opening that they'd had so far. So, you know, things are off and running. Um, but running the gym was, oh, my gosh, exhausting. <laughs> you know, here I am thinking I'm just going to be able to handle the financials, the payroll kind of, you know, stuff I can do in the background. But. I don't own a retail business, you know, sensible money isn't the kind of business that people walk in and you have mm -hmm. to be open. And if someone calls in sick, there will still got to be someone at the front desk and holy cow is a whole nother world. Um, not only that, but we were open less than six months when COVID hit. So Arizona shut us down. Um, they shut us down the first time for, I think uh, eight weeks, we were able to reopen for about four weeks and then got shut down again. And at that point, I was like, this, this, I can't do it. Like, this isn't going to work. We, we, you know, mutually decided we, this isn't going to work. And so uh, eventually we were able to find a buyer for the franchise at mm. substantially less than what I had put into it. I think, you know, getting it all open was probably about 400,000. Um, we found a buyer at a hundred thousand. Mm. So big financial loss, but also in hindsight, it's all the time and energy. You know, if I had put that time and energy into my existing business, <laughs> you know, wow. Like, so, and, and the funny thing is I've had this conversations with clients where, you know, well, they want to go off and do some crazy this or that. And I'm like, you know, if you just double down on what you're doing already, like, and, and maximize efforts there, you know, and I remember, you know, one of my fellow business owner clients was like, wow, that's like the best thing you ever said to me. And then I go, what do I do? Do I listen to that advice myself? No. Like what on earth was I thinking? Now I say all of that, but I do have to say, from a, a learning experience, like, wow, you know, like getting another MBA. I mean, you know, you're, uh, and for someone to say, well, you've run one successful business, you can do another. I'm going to say no. You know, <laughs> they can be completely different animals. You know, yes, COVID hit hit us hard and, and the timing couldn't have been worse. But even if it hadn't, mm -hmm it was very clear, like, this isn't for us. And so, you know, I, I could probably tell that early on before yeah. COVID even showed up, like, I, you know, whoa, what have we gotten into? And what have I gotten us into here? How did you miss it? You know, I mean, there's a lot of things that became obvious once you got in it, mm -hmm. but how did you miss it in the lead up to it? I think a couple of things, you know, to this day, it's the best workout I've ever done. Like, I love it. So you love it's the highly product. effective. Love the product. You know, we had people go through the six week challenge where <clears throat> the goal was to lose 6% body fat or 25 pounds. We saw so many people accomplish this. Like, truly, it was amazing. So, 
loving a product and being thrilled with running the business and the daily work that that entails and and making it profitable enough to justify those are two different things and so you know again the same thing we've seen clients fall in love with the stock that they love the product but it doesn't mean the business itself is going to be a highly profitable business profitable mm. business so you know that i would say would be number 1 mm. Um, is is really, you know, I truly fell in love with the product and there are still Rockbox franchises out there. I wish there was one, you know, the one here um, ended up closing down. I hope it comes back because, mm. you know, it is a phenomenal workout. Um, yeah, I would say okay. that's number one. Mm. Um, maybe I'll I'll just uh, share some of my thoughts on your story. I mean, the first thing yeah. is... Uh, if, if anybody listening or viewing this is thinking about opening a second business, <laughs> I have a challenge for them. And I have a challenge for you, Dana. My challenge to you is, why don't you instead create a new revenue stream in your existing business? And yep. it's top of mind because I <clears throat> just taught an, in an executive MBA and an MBA group, about 125 students here in Thailand who are the incoming students and they have a whole six week program where the alumni comes and they have a business and the alumni shows all the information about their business. And then these new intake MBA students and executive MBA students assignment is come up with a, a new revenue stream for this business. And I went to speak to them because I got that challenge six months ago, nine months ago, and but I also would say <clears throat> and make it sure it's five times higher price. And that's my challenge to to you and everybody who says, yeah. oh, I'm gonna go start a new, you know, business. No. And so I took that challenge and I created a product that's at least five times higher uh in value to my business. And I've been selling it and it's been amazing. And there's you know, there's some great books out there to help us to think about this. I think One Million Dollar Offers by Alex Hermosi is probably one of the best books on this. But I challenge down. everybody. Yeah, One Hundred Million Dollar Offers, Alex Hermosi. And I just, you know, one of the best books of all time on sales. And so I challenge everybody to do that. Now, the other it's thing. Yep, go ahead. I was going to say, it's so interesting because, you know, we do a, a, a very thorough financial planning process. Our price point is 6900 And, you know, it, it covers all of the nitty gritty stuff that people really getting ready to retire want to recover, want, want to cover. Well, when I was opening the gym, I would find myself there, you know, struggling to sell a $600 and, you know, gym membership or arguing with someone over a $10 late fee or, you know, and I remember like thinking, what, what are you doing? Like, you know, what, like, how is this, how did this happen? And so what you said makes complete sense. Cause it's like, if I was going to open a second business, what, what direction have I gone? This, this is just, it was, it was insanity. It was sanity. It was like, you were living this dichotomy every day. Yeah, I mean it's such a great um story and I think the lessons are, you know, great for the for the listeners. So let's let's now go go back in time a little bit and think about what you've learned and think about this question and that is based upon what you learned from this story and what you've continued to learn. What one action would you recommend our listeners take when they face the exact same situation to avoid suffering the same fate? Oh my gosh. You know, that's a really hard one because the first thing I'm going to say is if you have a financial planner, run it by them and listen to them. Because, you know, I was talking with my fiance the other day about, you know, some other crazy thing I did that didn't turn out. And he was like, oh, you didn't do what you'd tell your client to do, did you? <laughs> and so, you know, the one theme that anything I've done that that was a risk that hasn't worked out is it is not what I would have said for my client to do. So when I think about, you know, very prudent advice, you know, I, I think crypto, for example, is an amazing technology. Mm -hmm. And I went out and did this video when it came out, but I said 1%, like you shouldn't put more than 1% in because you're reading about people, you know, 
mortgaging their house to do this. But what did I do? Well, I put more than 1% in. And, you know, so, you know, I look at things that I've done because by nature, I think us entrepreneurs are risk takers. Mm. And I think, well, you know, the nature of the client I work with, I would never want to be responsible for some of these things that I know they can turn out badly. But for somehow when it's myself, I'm like, oh, you know, I'll just take this chance. And so for me, the number one rule that I have decided after after this was, you know, no, like, if, if it has to fall within the parameters of what I would tell a client to do. Now, that's hard to convey to listeners, right? Because not everybody has a financial planner. But most of us have someone in our head, it might be a parent, it might be a therapist, it might be that best friend, who's always that one who's like, eh, you know, and so it would be, well, listen to them. You know, don't just react. And we tend to, you know, I used to call those people my balloon poppers. Mm. You have this bright idea and someone comes along and they're like throwing darts at your balloon and taking all the air out of your enthusiasm. And, you know, but it's like, well, just give some credence to that. Like just for a second, put that hat on the little lens that they're looking from and, and say, okay, let's think about this. I call it sometimes asymmetric risk. Like, Mm -hmm. yes, there could be this potential, but if it doesn't work out, you know, what's the flip side is all that time and money, money, you know, we see clients that might take a risk on something that, you know, maybe the stock could go up 50%. But if it doesn't, their whole financial plan doesn't work. Right. Like that doesn't make sense. It's not logical to take that kind of risk. Mm. So who is that person that can help you see that point of view? It's funny because I have a friend in the U.S. that just set up an appointment and called me and we just had a call yesterday. He says, you're the one I go to because you're the rock. And I'm like, yeah, I just don't fall for the bullshit. And, you know, hey, I've listened to more than 700 stories of loss. So, you know, I've got a little bit behind me. I would also highlight something that I always say at the end of this podcast, which is create, grow and protect your wealth. And I separate creating and growing. Um, We create our wealth either through our salary, as my father did, and saving a portion of that. Or as business owners, we, we create wealth through the profits that we generate from the business. And the result of that is that's our wealth engine or our wealth machine. Growing our our wealth is a whole separate thing of how we grow that carefully in the market. And then as we particularly get to the age that you're dealing with, is really critical to um, protect. Let me ask you the next question, which is what's a resource of yours that you'd recommend people, you know, go listen to, view, buy, get, you know, something that that you would like to share? You know, when it comes to to investing, my go-to book is Four Pillars of Investing by Bill Bernstein. I mean, the behavioral finance components of that, it, it's just rock solid stuff. It's not a new book, but it's timeless. Uh, I think if you're looking about, you know, how you invest in the markets and you want a good perspective on that, you're, you're not going to beat that. And it's uh, not I also overwhelming. Lo- It's not overwhelming. Um, For younger generations, I also love The Behavior Gap by Carl Richards. So I think that is, you know, a great book. And honestly, you've probably read it, but one of the best books I've ever read is The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. Also a uh, guest on the show. Yes, uh, I'm sure he has been. And, you know, that that is the book I go, "Ah, I wish I would have written that. (laughs) It's just amazing. (laughs) And and just, I mean, I appreciate those recommendations, but I also want to hear from you about where someone who likes what you're talking about, where should they go to get more of you? More of me? Well, you can go to sensiblemoney.com. Yep. And from there, we have a learn page and all kinds of resources you can download. We host a free webinar about every six weeks. You'll find that on our website. We have free reports you can download. Uh, You can go to Amazon. If you Google my name, Dana Anspa, I'm sure that's in the show notes. Um, You will come up with all kinds of content. You can can put it into Amazon or just into Google and it will get you to some of my resources. Fantastic. And for the for the listeners and viewers out there, Morgan Housel was episode 255, and the title was A Successful Value Investor Focuses on Why a Stock is Cheap. 
Let me ask you what last question, what is your number one goal for the next 12 months besides starting a new revenue stream that's five times higher in price than your existing products? I don't know if that, if that was a goal of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so our number one goal, we actually, we just hired a chief operating officer for our business. And so it's really focusing on the next growth phase for the business. So when you were talking about reinventing, you know, a new product line within your own business, where I have found I can turn my entrepreneurial efforts is always reinventing or taking my current business to the next phase. So I've figured that that's where I have to channel my energy rather than looking outside. Mm. And so we're super excited about that. And that's really the focus right now is what, you know, what's that going to look like? Exciting. And um, I was just thinking about, you know, the, the additional, I don't know, three to five hours that you spent on your, you know, on the, uh, the, the, uh, the gym that you did. Uh, and what if you just spent that on your business for the next six months? So for all of us, you know, it's a great uh, reminder that, you know, allocate our resources right where we know we can make, you know, great returns. So, whew. Yeah. And your resources aren't just time and money. You know, lately I've thought a lot more about energy. Correct. And energy, we even talk about that here in our firm that, you know, the amount of energy you have is impacted by all kinds of things going on in your life. We have people that just had babies or they're dealing with a parent that needs to go into long-term care or, you know, their spouse just lost a job. And and so we really ask people to be cognizant about that. And it's okay for those energy levels to fluctuate. But when you're looking at taking on outside projects, that's been a, a huge realization for me. It's not only time and money. Like, you know, if something sucks a ton of energy out of you, even though it might not take much time or money, like you got to drop it. It's not good for you. Uh, energy is a source, really. When you run out of energy, you know, time runs out. And um, one one of the fun things to think about is where does energy come from? And um, I thought about that a lot and thought, traced it back. And I realized energy comes from the sun. So <laughs> well, of, that's true. It does. Think about that because yep. without the sun, we don't have plants. We don't have animals. We don't have food. We don't have everything. So do your sun salutations in the morning. <laughs> Listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. As we conclude, Dana, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? No parting words, but it's been wonderful to be here. Thank you. We love your story and we appreciate it. That's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today. We added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.